to you weekly for um, a digital copy. Just come up here and get right down your email, uh, and I can email them to you. They may come out Sunday morning very early or Saturday night very late, so don't expect them like Friday evening or something. All right. Well, let's go ahead and begin by, um, I'm going to read a passage from 1 Corinthians 11, and verse 1. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Let's pray. Uh, Father, once again, we would like to uh, thank you for the men and women uh, in our own life that we have known who have gone before us, uh, some whom have passed out of our life um, by us moving away, or some who have gone on to be with you. We want to thank you for the impact they've had on our lives, the example they've given us, and we pray that you would help us to imitate them as they have imitated you. And also as we take time to look back thousands of years uh, prior to our own time, we ask that you would help us to uh, look at your people and how they have loved you and how they have obeyed you and how they have fallen short and repented of their sins. Um, and we pray that you would help us to imitate them to the extent uh, that they have imitated you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this week we are going to begin by looking at uh, kind of a very broad scope. Last week we kind of looked at one individual, uh, Augustine. Uh, this week we're going to look at kind of the, the changes happening in the uh, Roman Empire leading up into what we call the medieval age, or you could think about the changes happening in the late antique period of history. Um, and that's going to set us up for a new world order or kind of a new way of doing things, some unexpected things. So uh, we can go ahead and go probably to the third slide. And we're going to begin with this. In, in the third century in Rome, that's years 200 to 300, uh, there was a great crisis in Rome. The Roman Empire had been going steady. We had just gotten out of the period of the five good emperors, uh, which the historian Edward Gibbon said, which you could disagree with. But he said, if you could pick any time in human history, this would be the time to live. It's a great time of peace and prosperity uh, in the Roman world. Uh, but in the third century, there's a great crisis, and it's a military crisis. We have a uh, tribes invading and pressing into the borders of the Roman Empire. We have a great economic crisis. Uh, standard of living is dropping. Uh, prices for bread and things are getting uh, much more expensive. Wages are not going as far. There's a political crisis. In about 35 years, I think yeah, uh, 235 to 284, so about 50 years, you have 26 emperors that are legitimate. 40-something usurpers. <laughs> okay, So we're talking a change of leadership every few years. So there's a lot of instability there. Also, moral crisis. People are beginning to ask questions about what the future holds. Uh, will they be safe in the future? Uh, there's a, it's a great time of insecurity. Uh, and this, by the way, is the time when we see the Christian church start to really take off and grow, kind of answering some of these great uh, insecurities uh, and people flocking to the church. This is also the time we see the Roman emperors, starting with Decius in the uh, breath of year 254, um, cracking down on Christians. We have an empire-wide, one of the first empire-wide persecutions, uh, and that will lead later to the great persecution at the end of the second, beginning of the, I'm sorry, into the third century. Um, now, why were they persecuting them? They looked around and said, look how crazy things are. Why is it like this? It's because we failed to honor the gods. We don't make proper sacrifice to the gods. Therefore, we have this group of people, a large group of people that's growing and increasing and they worship this other god, and they refuse to make sacrifices to our god. So that was part of a way of trying to bring back stability and peace to the empire. Um, and then eventually, the emperor's, empire is going to stabilize under two uh, emperors. Diocletian, who is a pagan, and he institutes the great persecution. And then our first uh, Christian emperor, Constantine. They're going to reorganize the empire and change it. And we're not going to get into all the details of what they do. But one thing they do that will be important for us is they are going to start allowing uh, Germanic and other what they would call barbarian tribes to begin to settle along the borders of Rome, inside the borders of Rome, in order to help provide military support, uh, provide manpower for the armies and things like this, also to help cultivate the fields, get things in production. So that begins to happen. The empire stabilizes for a time, and this is during the period of the great church councils that we've seen, the debates over uh, Christology at the Council of Nicaea and later of, uh, of Chalcedon. But during the 4th and 5th centuries, we kind of have another crisis in the Roman Empire, at least in the West. We're getting more tribes starting to press upon the empire, um, and the Romans continue to do the same policy they've been doing, which is to allow these barbarian, these Germanic tribes to settle within the borders. But eventually what's going to happen is the Roman Empire in the West is going to become so weak, these tribes are essentially going to gain autonomy and set up their own kingdoms and fracture the West. So let's go now, Jeremy, to the next slide. 
And after the Roman Empire falls, we can speak of Rome having three children, okay? <laughs> the, the great Roman Empire gives birth to three great civilizations that will dominate our period of medieval history. Uh, the first one is going to be the Byzantine Empire. Now, if you want to talk about the date that the Roman Empire fell in the West, we would say that would be the year 476, okay? So 476, one of my favorite historical ironies, the last Roman emperor, his name is Romulus Augustulus. What does that mean? Well, why is that significant? Romulus was the first king of Rome back in like 754 BC, a long time ago. And Augustus was what? The first Roman emperor, okay, right around the turn of, of, uh, to the first century AD, okay? So the last Roman emperor is named in the West Romulus Augustulus. Augustulus means little Augustus, kind of a little uh, cute way to say it, I guess. Um, but nonetheless, the empire is going to fall, but the Roman Empire actually does not end. It stays in existence in the east. Think about uh, where Constantinople, think about Greece, parts of Asia Minor where modern-day Turkey is at, parts of Syria as well, and it will be known as the Byzantine Empire. They called themselves Roman, and they consider themselves Roman. We call them Byzantine to help distinguish. It will last until 1453, until it's destroyed by the Ottoman Turks, who are and this is going to be something that gets introduced into our historical time frame as well. The Ottoman Turks are Muslims. That's a new religion that is not previously in vogue, in our, at least in our last history course. Okay? Uh, the next is the Islamic Caliphate, or, or the, the kingdoms of, of the Muslim faith. Uh, it is one of the most unexpected, as well as the rise of Christianity, unexpected things in the history of the world. Uh, a guy in the Arabian Peninsula, which is a backwater, begins to preach a message. People begin to follow uh, and then they spread, and in about 100 years, they conquer one of the largest empires in world history. I mean, it's like, boom, they're there. All, a lot of the great centers of Christianity are now under Islamic control, and a lot happens when they come onto the scene. It's very, very unexpected. Uh, the Byzantines and the Muslims, at least early on for the Muslims, they'll have something later on in, in their culture around the uh, 10th century that will change this. They preserve a lot of the heritage of the ancient world, the classical world. And that's very important because these sources will stay in the East. They'll be lost to the West off and on, and they'll eventually be reintroduced, sometimes through Muslim scholars, sometimes through Byzantine scholars. That will be important when we get to uh, people like Thomas Aquinas. For instance, the philosopher Aristotle was lost to the West by and large. They had some of his works. Around the 12th century and 13th century, his works get reintroduced into uh, uh, to Europe, um, and, and they're kind of new at that time for them. Uh, and the last, and where we're going to focus today, is Western Europe. Western Europe becomes a series of different kingdoms, kind of a fragmented place with different kingdoms, sometimes big kings, sometimes small, petty kings. Uh, and let's go on to the next slide. So when we're looking at the West, and I'll have a map to show you in a second, um, we've got several Germanic tribes, and here are some of the most important ones. You have the Vandals, you have the Visigoths and Ostrogoths, you have the Franks and Burgundians. They're going to settle inside the Roman Empire and form kingdoms. Okay, eventually it's going to kind of parse out that way. The West went from being a very organized, um, kind of under one administrative head with the Western Roman Emperor, uh, to being a fractured group of kings. They're, they're not held together anymore by any one thing much. Um, the Germanic tribes, this is important were pagan, or later on, some of them would be Aryan Christians. Now, what is an Aryan Christian? They would be a heretical Christian that would deny the full divinity of Christ. In 325, the Council of Nicaea declares that Christ is fully God. He's fully divine. He's not some lesser divinity like uh, the heretic Arius had taught. But there's a big back and forth between uh, which view is going to prevail. Uh, sometimes some of the emperors are Aryan, and sometimes they're what we would say orthodox uh, and they battle back and forth. Well, one of the um, first missionaries actually is an Arian, <laughs> and he slips across the border and takes the gospel to the Goths. So you've got the Visigoths and Ostrogoths, and preaches an Arian form of Christianity that denies the full divinity of Christ. Okay? Well, when they come and invade the West, they bring that faith with them or their paganism with them. Okay? Um, so we've got these overlords who are now pagan or Arian, but... Remember, the Roman Empire in the West was becoming more and more Christian. So you have in some places, more than others, a large subset of the people who are Christian and have been Christian for a little bit of the time. Not, not all of them. There's still a lot of paganism in Rome, even when Rome, the official religion of Rome is Christianity. There is some cultural unity due to uh, things in Roman culture that we won't get into that helps, like Roman law, for instance. But really interestingly, every one of these barbarian kingdoms is going to look east where the Roman emperor is, which is in Constantinople, which we just call the Byzantine Empire. So they all look for legitimacy and kind of act as his subordinates there. 
Okay? Let's go to the map, and I'll just show you some of these. Now, just don't pay attention to any of those lines. Nobody really knows the exact movement of peoples. People just kind of say, well, maybe this and this and this. Ignore it. <laughs> Here's where a lot of the tribes do end up. We do know this. Uh, the Visigoths will end up largely in Spain and some other peoples as well. The Vandals, where we get our word vandalism from, uh, live in North Africa. Um, now, they're Aryan. The um, Visigoths are also Aryan for, for most of their time. Here's the Franks. They will be pagan, then Aryan, and then eventually be the first to convert to Orthodox Christianity. And they're located in, you could think, modern-day kind of France, uh, largely. The Burgundians are there. The Franks will conquer them. You have the Ostrogoths here in central Italy. And then here's the Byzantine Empire. To the east, you have the Persian Empire. And just for later on, there's the Arabian Desert, where Islam will originate. And it will capture an exhausted Byzantine and an exhausted Persian Empire because they fought each other until they're tired. And he's like, boom, takes them both out. Okay? So that's kind of the area we're dealing with. We're going to largely focus uh, here. All right, let's go to the next slide. So we have uh, three big developments that institute kind of a new world order. And that would be the rise of the Roman church, uh, the church centered in Rome. That's eventually what we're going to think of as the papacy the Roman Pope, the conversion of Clovis, who was a Frank. That's a, that picture to the side there, or that carving there, is of his baptism. I wonder how deep that well is he's standing in, or if he had really short legs. But uh, And the next thing is the emergence of Benedictine monasticism, so monks that follow the rule of St. Benedict. Okay, So those are going to be the three big things that make a great impact on uh, Western Europe particularly. So let's look at the first of those, the Roman Church. You can go to the next uh, to the Roman context. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about Rome because I think maybe if we are thinking about it backwards and don't have a lot of the historical data, we think Rome's been big and strong. The Roman Pope's been big and strong since the beginning. That's not actually the case. Uh, so we're going to kind of just put it in context a little bit. Um, so early on, Rome is an important and influential church. There's no denying that. It's very important. It's very influential. Why? Um, early on, the, the teaching that uh, Christ gave the keys of the church, and from Matthew 16, to Peter. That's taken, well, we, he's been given to Peter. Now we have this doctrine that develops also early on called apostolic succession, which means legitimacy of a church is based upon if you have succeeded a legitimate bishop or a priest, and they pass that down. So Peter started it, he passed it down, and we trace. If you read a lot of the early Christian sources, they're very meticulous about tracing who succeeded who to, the, to be the bishop. Okay? So that's, a lot of that develops there. Um, they also will play an important role in a lot of the debates uh, around the church councils and things and some conflicts. And also, very importantly, now this is going to be hard for us to understand, but it's, it's the site, allegedly, of the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. Now, the cult of the saints, we're not going to go off a rabbit trail here. It would be fun to chase, but we're not going to. We'll just say this. The cult of the saints, kind of this giving honor, going to the grave sites of saints and martyrs, became very important uh, in the medieval church and the early church uh, develops differently, but one of the things that they saw there was the saint was like a patron in the Roman society, and the patron was a more powerful person you would go to for aid and for help, and they see this in a spiritual way as well here. So you got two of the most important saints of the church or, or, or in the scriptures, Peter and Paul, here at Rome, so it's very important for those reasons, okay? But with all those things said, it was not believed to be the head of the church. The East did not believe this at all, <laughs> Um, oh, one more thing about Rome. Why is it also important? It was the capital of the Roman Empire for a long, 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 long time. So there's that too. But the East did not believe that it was the head of the church. There were other very important churches. Let's just list a few of them. Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, all four in the East. The other important church at the time was Carthage. That's in the West. It's in North Africa. That's near where Augustine uh, lived. So you've got these other important churches. Uh, the East resents uh, the uh, the bishop of Rome, when he tries to intervene into church affairs in the East. They don't like it. <laughs> um, so they push back on that. Um, they do respect Rome, though, like they would respect the other places. And, and also you have the emperors in the East, the Byzantine emperors, and also the Frankish kings later on. They will exercise strong, at times, control over the church in Rome. So the church in Rome is not this big, powerful entity all the time. At times, they're quite weak and that they're controlled by either local Italian politics or local family politics in Rome or by the Frankish king or sometimes by the Byzantine emperor and they're mere stooges. So there's this kind of mixed history of its power. It kind of rises and flows at times. You get some very strong popes um, 
By the way, the word pope comes from, uh, it, it means something like father, and a lot of the bishops in a lot of the, those important churches were called papa or pope. Okay, so it's not as if that's a title strictly relegated in the, in the ancient church just to the pope of Rome. All right, well, let's go on to the next slide, and we'll look at uh, how does papal authority grow. We kind of have that base understanding. It's got some important historical connotations with it, important sites of the martyrs and things, but how does it begin to grow? Well, they, they grounded, of course, in Matthew 16, 16 through 19, where Jesus seems to have said, according to them, that the keys of the church have been given to Peter. Peter seems very important. He seems to be the leader of the apostles. And if Christ came and established one church, it would make sense that he would do what? Put one person in charge of it, and the people that succeed him would be the person in charge. That's kind of the thinking behind it. And early on, you do have a few popes making strong claims, like, you shouldn't have done that without consulting me. Now, it doesn't mean the people that they said that to agreed with them, but they make very strong claims. Also, we see um, after the Germanic invasions, after the whole West, remember, you've got this unity of the empire. After now, you've got these fractured kingdoms coming in, and things are changing. Be a little bit of chaos, probably not as chaotic as it often gets depicted, but a little bit of chaos and overturning, people fleeing the frontier sites, going to the cities, things like this. Um, one thing that's going to hold people together is going to be the Christian faith. A lot of the subject peoples are still Christian, and they do look to the most important city. I, we do this to some extent, too. You know, I mean, if we have a, a larger city, we might, like Nashville or something, and there's an influential pastor there, we might look to somebody like that. We kind of think of that's going on, too. In the West, the most important city and the most important church are going to be Rome at this time. Carthage is pretty important as well. So they begin to, to look to it as well after the Germanic invasions kind of mix things up a little bit. And then you get some uh, popes like Pope Leo the Great. He's really the first strong pope that's really going to kind of move toward more of a modern understanding of what the papacy is going to be. Now, let's look at some things that he did. He's going to intervene in some controversies in the East. So he's in Rome in the West. The Eastern bishops are debating and squabbling over things. And he's going to say, I'm going to impose myself and get involved and write a letter and tell them what I think <laughs> or what I think should be done. Okay, so they resent that. They don't like that he's intervening. Uh, there's a big debate around the natures of Christ. Is Christ, is he just a divine figure, or does he just have a divine nature, just a human nature, or is it both? And he writes what will become the official position of the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So his letter to the council essentially gets adopted. So you can see if he's claiming all this authority and then he writes something, they're like, yes, we think that's right. You can see how someone's prestige would grow. Okay, so that's one thing that he does that helps the Roman papacy grow. But another thing, on the secular side of things, Attila the Hun, who the medievals called the scourge of God, because he came into the West and he destroyed lots of things, uh, though he was also paid off by the Eastern emperors to go West. They're like, hey, we'll give you some money. You go protect the guys in the West. Uh, but nonetheless, he came raiding and pillaging, uh, and he was coming towards Rome. Okay? Now, the Western world's kind of in a little bit of disarray, and Leo finds himself being one of the people on a delegation and probably the leader of that delegation to talk to Attila the Hun. So you have the bishop of the church in Rome going out with an entourage and meeting this great barbarian warlord Attila the Hun. Okay? And something happens in that meeting. Attila leaves and goes north and he dies shortly after that. But Rome is spared. Now, the way the story gets told later is that as Leo came up, uh, Peter and Paul appeared above him and confronted and terrified Attila and caused Attila to flee. I'll let you sort out what you think about that, but that's the way the story is told. Um, nonetheless, that causes his prestige to grow. That's in the year 452. In the year 455, the Vandals, remember that group that was in North Africa? They come in and sack Rome. Leo mitigates the sack. It's not as bad as it could have been. He gets them to kind of take it easy in some extent. They don't take churches and things like this, and they allow people to seek sanctuary. But nonetheless, Rome falls. That's the second time Rome has been sacked, by the way, for, uh, 411 or something like that in 455. Before that, the last time the city of Rome had been sacked, get this, in the 350 roughly B.C. It's been a long time since the city of 700 years since the city of Rome has been sacked, Okay. Uh, Jerome essentially weeps, the, the great uh, uh, m monastic uh, Jerome who writes the Latin Vulgate, uh, translation of the Bible, weeps when this happened. The fall of Rome in, in 411 uh, causes Augustine to write his great work, The City of God. So it's a big deal. You need to understand, even for Christians at the time, uh, when Rome falls, it's kind of like your whole, it may be like right now if, the, if Washington, D.C. got bombed, we'd just all be like shaken, right? It's kind of what it was for them. It was, it was hard to understand. And then you have a pope like Pope Galatius essentially telling, writing to the Eastern Emperor and saying, I just want you to know that the pope is superior 
or bishops and priests are superior to secular rulers. You rule over the body that's mortal. I rule over the soul which is immortal. Therefore, I am superior. So you got these pretty strong claims early on. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you can see in this painting there, Jesus handing Peter the keys in a Roman uh, forum, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, so over time, um, Latin Christianity is going to begin to spread uh, throughout Western Europe, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And Rome becomes the accepted head of the church. People start to buy in the doctrine of Peter and apostolic succession, and they begin to look to Rome for leadership and submit themselves to them, though not everybody right away. Um, Yet again, we've already mentioned this, but at times the Roman papacy is going to be on a kind of a higher end, and sometimes it's going to have a fall. Local politics will play a big part of that. Sometimes it becomes essentially local families fighting over who's going to be the pope. <laughs> it becomes quite um, dynastic in that sense. All right, let's go to the Franks next. We can go two over. All right, so the next big thing, so we've got the emergence of the Roman church. Now the next piece of this new world order is going to be the conversion of Clovis. Now, Clovis is a, a, a king of the Frankish people, so of the Franks. Um, he is going to be converted uh, around 496. Uh, here's the story. His wife was Burgundian. Okay? Now, the Burgundians were Aryan at the time, but for some reason, and I'm not sure how, she actually is an adherent to the Orthodox faith. She believes Christ is fully divine. Okay? She is sent to him. She, they are married, and she wants to baptize their children. She wants to... Um, have him convert to the faith, all these kind of things, he will have none of it, okay? He refuses to. Well, one day before he goes into a great battle, uh, another Germanic tribe's coming in to raid. Um, his wife says, listen, I, I fear that you're going to die. Pray to God for help and pray that he will deliver you. She's thinking probably spiritually so that if you die in this battle, you, you won't go to hell. Um, and she, he leaves, and then she goes and prays for the rest of the, until he comes back. She's spending time in prayer. In the course of the battle, the battle starts to go poorly for the Franks, and he realizes, I think we're about to die. So he yells out, God, if you will deliver me from this battle and help us to win, I will convert to uh, Christianity. I will become a Christian. And they win the battle. And he uh, becomes uh, a convert to Christianity and will be baptized either around 496 or maybe at the, at the end of his life. Uh, but that is very important. I know it may not seem important, but you have one of these Germanic kingdoms. The first one is going to become Orthodox Christian. And now the, Ro the Roman Pope will now have in the West somebody that is an ally in that sense. The only other person he has is somebody in the East, the Byzantine emperors, and they are really focused on the East, not so much on the West. Okay? Um, so that is a very important uh, turning point in, in world history. Now eventually the Merovingian kings, which is the dynasty of Clovis, they will eventually get weak, uh, and power will go to the leaders of their palace, or what are called the mayors of the palace. And a new important family called the Carolingians are going to rise to power. Carolingians comes from uh, Carlos, which is Charles Magnus, Charles the Great. That's where the name Carolingian comes from. So this is his family. He's not the originator of the dynasty, but uh, it's uh, uh, adapted to him after the fact. So let's go to the Carolingians in Rome. What we're going to see now is the Carolingian dynasty and the Roman church begin to merge and make an alliance together. This is very important for the stability of the church in the West. Uh, the first figure in the family, there's his statue there, looking very strapping there, with his battle axe and shield there. He's got his greaves on, or shin guards, I guess, maybe. But anyway, his name is Charles Martel. It's a great, one of the great wrestling names of history. Charles the Hammer is what it means. So anyway, the, the, these guys have a lot of great names. They've got like Charles the Bald and Charles the Fat and you know, Charles the Hammer. A lot of great wrestling names. So anyway, if you do decide to take a career in that, look to the Merovingians and the Carolingians for wrestling names. All right. Um, he, very importantly, now we, we'll cover this later, the, the Muslims have been spreading west. They've taken all over North Africa. They've actually come into Spain and taken over most of Spain. And now they're trying to press into what we would call modern-day France. With the Battle of Tours, or Poitiers, in 732, Charles Martel decisively defeats uh, the Muslim forces at that battle. And essentially, if you want to think about it, the western door to the Muslims is now closed. Essentially, you can think about Spain and the Pyrenees Mountains there being the boundary they're not going to come further than that. And the door in the east is going to be Constantinople. Constantinople will be the nut the Muslims can't crack until 1453. But they besiege it around this same time too. And they try again and again. So for about 700 more years, Constantinople in the east will not fall. So if you want to think about two doors to keep the Muslims out of Europe, it would be Constantinople in the east and then uh, kind of uh, Spain and France, kind of the boundary there uh, where the Frankish Empire is. Uh, very importantly too, the Merovingian kings were Christian. 
But what happens over time is they're more nominally Christian because what happens when the king converts, a lot of other people thinking like, well, it would be very advantageous for my political career if I also was the same religion of the king, convert to the faith. So that leads to nominalism. They're Christian in name only largely, but also you would still have pagan peoples living there, other Aryan Christians living in the area. And just because the king is Christian doesn't mean they're going to necessarily convert. So in Merovingian Gaul, you have a large area that's nominally Christian, unchristian, maybe still pagan, and it needs a lot of reform. The church is not in a great state there. When the Carolingians, they're not kings yet, but when they come to power and, uh, in the Merovingian palace, they do things like this. They ally with local uh, bishops and monks and help try to reform the church. Uh, a very important one is going to be, I don't know if I put his name, yeah, here, is Boniface. He will be known as the apostle to the Germans. He'll come into our story a little bit later. Um, he's going to partner with some of the Carolingians in reforming the church. Okay? Uh, the next is Pepin the Short. Uh, again, he partners with Boniface to reform the church there. Um, but most importantly with him, he is going to exchange military aid to the Pope. Now, what's going on with the Pope? Well, the Eastern Empire is not able to send help. They've spent lots of resources earlier on trying to take back Italy, and now they're broke, and they're being attacked from other places, and they cannot be involved in Italy anymore. Okay? Well, there's a new tribe that emerges that comes south, known as the Lombards. The Lombards begin to uh, come into northern Italy and are making their way toward Rome. The Pope needs help. Where does he appeal to? Can't go to the east. He tries. So he goes to the west, to this new powerful kingdom of the uh, Merovingians, and asks for help. Well, who does he talk to? One of the Carolingians, because they're kind of the, really the people in charge. He talks to Pepin the Short, and they make a deal. In exchange for me sending uh, soldiers to help you in Italy, how about you depose the last Merovingian king and crown me king of the Franks? <laughs> so the Pope says, sure, I'll depose the emperor. Now think about this. The Pope is now being given the ability to do what? To depose emperors at will. This is going to set up some big power struggles later on, okay? And to make emperors. Who made Pepin emperor? The Pope did, right? He's got some power struggles coming on later down the pipe. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Well, Boniface will come by, on the orders of Pope Zacharias to uh, crown Pepin, and then later on he'll come back again and be crowned by, in Rome by a, another Pope, Pope Stephen. And now the Carolingian dynasty begins officially with Pepin the Short. Another important development as he comes down to Italy, Pepin conquers the lands of the Lombards. What do you do with those lands? He gives them back to the church. This is known as the donation of Pepin. Now, why is that important? The church now has secular lands they rule. The church in Rome is not now just a spiritual authority, but they're now a temporal authority. They have people that are under their control, not in the spiritual sense, but in the sense of you are on our land, you farm our land, you do what we say. Okay, they are now kings in one sense. This will be very, very important later. This time, too, there's a document called the Donation of Constantine, which was a forged document um, around this time that it seems the church forged it. And it claimed that when the emperor Constantine was alive, he got leprosy. And the bishop of Rome, Sylvester at the time, heals him of leprosy and gave him, all, gave him power to rule all the lands in the West. <laughs> okay? That's a forgery. And that won't be discovered until about the year 1400. Okay? But what are the popes going to appeal to often? Look, Constantine wrote us a letter saying that he gave us the right to rule over all this area. Okay? So that's another way they prop up their power later on. All right, eventually we're going to get to Charlemagne. He will come back into our story later on. Uh, but he will be crowned, notice the title here, not King of the Franks. He also takes the title King of the Lombards. He's called, now here's the way this story is told. It's kind of funny. It said that Charlemagne was in Rome to pray, and he was at the altar praying, and all of a sudden the Pope came up and put a crown on him and said, Hail Charles, the emperor of the Romans. Kind of like, oh, it's kind of, you know, willy-nilly, almost unplanned. I don't know if I buy that or not. I, I probably was orchestrated because everybody also is chanting in unison. And usually, you know, things that happen in the spur of the moment don't have choruses that are all in the same key together. But nonetheless, he gets crowned emperor of the Romans. This begins what we know and will be a very big staple of the medieval era, the Holy Roman Empire, which Voltaire, skeptic that he was, said the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. <laughs> but um, by the way, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles will be the one that is kind of Martin Luther's greatest enemy. Okay, so the Holy Roman Empire is going to be around the time of the Reformation. So we've got all these pieces that are starting to take shape and going to form kind of the basis of what we'll see later. All right, we can go to the next slide. And this is kind of a conclusion slide, uh, just a new order. 
So now we've got a kind of a merging of the Roman papacy and the Frankish kingdom. Charlemagne views himself as a protector of the church. By the way, Constantine saw himself as the 13th apostle. <laughs> a little blasphemous in my opinion, but he saw himself as the 13th apostle. In a sense, he said, I am in some sense a protector of the church. Charlemagne saw himself in the same way. So he would say he's supreme over whom? Any bishop, including Rome. So we're going to get this power struggle developed. He will appoint bishops and priests and things like this. This will introduce a big power struggle in the Middle Ages over who gets to appoint bishops and priests. Is it the pope and other bishops, or is it lay people like kings? It's a big deal that's going to come down the pipe. That kind of gets going in big, in big time at this era. All right, um, the Carolingian kings are going to keep their foot on, but this painting is great. It's made much later, but you see what he's holding in the, that hand over there? The, the church, <laughs> showing his kind of control over temporal and, and secular, or, or spiritual and temporal things, okay? Um, very importantly, too, the focus of the church now is not to the east anymore. Nobody's looking east to the Byzantine emperor. Everybody's staying focused in the west. And by the way, over time, what's going to happen east and west, where you could say Constantinople and Rome, is they're going to have theological divisions, things like this as well, that begin to cause them to drift apart. This is going to lead to the two great divisions before the Reformation of the church, what we would call the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Or we could say the Latin Church or the Roman Church. Let's go to the next development. That's Benedictine monasticism. <clears throat> I am not going to cover everything on this slide. Uh, I, on these slides, there's a, a decent bit here. Um, I, I talked about monasticism in the last section, so some of the background stuff you can look at there if you want to look that lesson up. Uh, but I do want to begin with some initial thoughts and reflections because I think monasticism to us as Protestants is pretty strange. Uh, maybe we th I think it's very sinful and not a good thing. So let's just begin with some basic reflections. Uh, Mark Knoll, who's an evangelical church historian, very prominent evangelical historian, he says this, The rise of monasticism was, after Christ's commission to his disciples, that's a great commission, the most important and in many ways the most beneficial institutional event, I think it's important, he says institutional, event in the history of Christianity. Okay, um, So he's saying the establishment of monasticism and its kind of formulation was one of the most important institutional events in church history. It's probably to some extent right. We can, he maybe overstates a little bit, but he's probably to some extent right. It was also said about the monks that they civilized Europe uh, by the cross, by the book, and by the, ready for this? The plow. What would they do? They would escape from society, try to get it alone. They would take land that was unclaimed, often not able to be farmed. They became proficient at draining swamps and reclaiming unusable land and making it arable once again. So anyway, those three things are said about them. Uh, a prominent um, historian of missions says that we could look at the evolution, um, spreading the gospel in Europe this way. From the year 500 to 1,000, you have the very kind of nominal inclusion of European peoples into Christianity. And then from the year 1,000 to 1,500, you have kind of the going deeper with those people. So everybody's kind of more loosely, nominally Christian for those 500 years, probably a little overstated too. And in the next 500 years, we're going to see uh, groups of people called the friars, like the Dominicans and Franciscans. And what do they do? They are traveling preachers. They go around preaching to the peoples in places. So they're trying to maybe deepen the faith to some extent there. Uh, let's just look at some of the influence of monasticism. We could say a lot more, but these people, a lot, uh, Augustine was a monastic of sorts. He would have loved to live just the monastic life. He ended up living kind of a pastoral slash monastic life he, as he tried. Uh, but biblical translation of the vernacular, Jerome, who was a monk, uh, two, uh, two brothers, Cyril and Methodius, they were missionaries to the uh, Slavic peoples, and they translated the Bible into their language. Um, missionary activity, tons of it. They were pretty much the missionaries of the early ch church after the apostles and after kind of the first, uh, I guess, 100, 200, century, or 200 years. You got Patrick, you got Boniface, Raymond Lowell, missionary to the, to the Muslims, uh, Cyril Methodius, we just mentioned. Uh, you got uh, writings of history of Christianity, principally with Bede, who's a monk in England. Uh, we get hymns and songs, uh, Gregory, Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, you can put Francis here for a lot of things, but love of the created order. Theology, one of the greatest theologians of the time is going to be Aquinas, who is a Dominican friar. He's a member of the monastic order. Uh, they will keep central, daily, frequent Bible reading and prayer. That's very important for all monastic movements, is uh, the reading of the scripture, chanting of the psalms, uh, and prayer. Also, a lot of the, if you like to read classic books, 
one of the groups of people, there's others too, but one of the groups of people you need to be thinking are the monks. They copied largely Christian material, but they also, some of them, would uh, copy down other texts as well. Uh, Beowulf, uh, for instance, if you've read that, that was saved by uh, monks. A lot of the uh, ancient philosophy texts have been found, were found in monasteries during the Renaissance okay, because these people copied them and preserved them. Um, so you've got, those are just a few things, but monks were at the center of all those things. By the way, Martin Luther is a member of an Augustan order. <laughs> He's a monk, right? Now, he wrestles with that, and he critiques it, and I think we should too, but just know that this is at the center of all those things for about 1,500 years, a little bit less. Um, the brief overview, um, I will probably skip for time's sake, so you can look at that, and that is mainly covered in another lecture, at least pieces of that. Um, going on now to the Benedictine monasticism. Um, St. Benedict, who lived in the 5th uh, and 6th century, writes a, what's known as a rule. So it's essentially an ordering of, a, of the monastic community. How shall you order yourselves? Here's, it's about 80 pages long. You can go print it off and read it. How will the monks live in this society? Because they're going to live in a community. Some monks do live off by themselves. You get the really strange ones that like to live on pillars for like a decade. And the only way that anything comes up or down is by a string and a rope. Okay? And, but people love them, by the way, and flock to them for prayer and for advice and things. But we get the communal monasticism, which Benedictine monasticism is a part, where you have a group of monks living in a community together. Okay? We have a lot of very harsh asceticism. Essentially, people will destroy their bodies trying to discipline themselves by fasting intensely, by sleeping on hard, cold ground with no blankets, uh, things like this, and they will destroy their bodies um, doing this. What does Benedict do? He does not follow the harsh side of that. It's very strict, we should still say, but his rule, his order, is taking a little bit of the cut off the extreme uh, versions of monasticism and making it doable, but still strict and, and hard. Not everybody was able to do it. Uh, but his rule become the most important Bened or, or monastic rule in the West. The uh, Carolingian emperors will mandate that it be the form of monasticism in their kingdom. So the Franks, if you're going to be a monk there, they mandate it that you follow this order. It will later be carried to England and will spread all throughout um, the uh, Western world. Now, what are some uh, central kind of tenets of this rule? One of the most important things of it is going to be this, the importance of communal worship. They met eight times a day <laughs> for communal worship. Some, uh, most of these were about half an hour. So, uh, some of them were an hour. Midnight was the first one, okay? And then 6 a.m., and then about every three hours, okay? They read in the Psalms where the psalmist says, seven times I have prayed, I pray to you daily. And then later on he says, and I also pray at night. So they're like, seven plus one, eight. All right, boom, we got it. They're trying to obey the Scripture in some sense, right? Um, so they keep at the center reading of the Scriptures in those meetings, um, they chant the psalms, all, all that kind of stuff. See how important it is. The psalms, get this, guys. The psalms, the entire 150 will be gone through in one week's time. These people knew their scripture. Martin Luther, I mean, if you read Martin Luther, he knows the scriptures very well. Why? That's what we did every day. Okay? Uh, there were times of private prayer, private reading as well, uh, that would be spiritual. So that's a very important part. But lest you think that all these guys do is sit around and pray, which is probably the most important work that they do, they also do manual labor. Benedict thinks that idleness is a tool of the devil. So after you get done praying and having these communal worship times, you go out in the fields and work, or you be, or the one who cooks. And lest they think that cooking, which I guess at, at the time they thought was not that important or, or prestigious of a job, they'd rather maybe be one of the craftsmen or something like this. During one of the communal services, they would switch out the cook, kind of before everybody, to kind of hold it up. And one of the brothers would be the cook for that day. Okay? And then the next. So you didn't have the same job every day either, lest potentially the warrior's pride could come in. You could take great pride in your craft. So they switch it around. Manual labor is important. This is a painting done much later, but those are monks working in a field. <laughs> um, so manual labor was very important. Now, Benedict does stress the importance of removal from the world. And this is one place where we rightly should probably get a little uncomfortable and maybe push back against. Th they see the world, and this gets developed even more extreme by some other groups later, is that if you go into the world... There's the potential of contamination. So as much as possible, we're going to isolate ourselves. But we do understand, to some extent, we have to have relations with the world. So they would appoint one monk to be in charge of visitors. And they were very uh, glad to show hospitality and encouraged to show hospitality. But usually that was done by one monk while the other stayed away. <laughs> okay, they had a room kind of at the gate uh, of their monastery for that. 
So that is important, and taking care of the sick and things like that, they saw as important too. But primarily, their work is going to be prayer. Now, maybe we can say, well, they did a little too much of that, not other things. That's fine. I think one thing we do a little too much of today is a little too much working and a lot less time praying. We look often for more, how can I solve this issue? What can I do? Other than I need to go to God in prayer to solve an issue. So we we can learn from them, even if their balance was uh, too far to one side. Uh, But his rule proved to be adaptable to local situations. It also saw that they put older, more experienced monks with younger monks so that when you got called at midnight to come to worship, you didn't have an excuse because you had an older veteran there to say, come on, get up, no excuses, we got to go. So he understood things like that. And and you can read the rule. It's a a very interesting rule. One of the things that would be difficult is, one of the things they hold up is uh, not using many words, even remaining silent. They don't mandate silence. Later, there are vows of silence to certain monastic orders. But to let your words be very, very few and to keep your laughter either to a minimum or not at all because they saw it as a potential for you to become very lax and even to laugh at holy things. So they got some good ideas there. Maybe they take it a little too far. But nonetheless, it spreads all throughout Western Europe and it becomes a very easy way for monastic groups to be organized all throughout the West. All right, I'm going to leave the evaluate, evaluating monastic as a Protestant. For you. you can read that. Those are just some of my thoughts about how we can think about it as Protestants, how we can maybe critique it while at least saying they did do a lot of good things at the same time. Let's go to the conversion of the English. And what I hope to do here is this kind of a, a, a study where we look at those three elements and how they kind of merge and come together. Okay? <clears throat> um, this is a picture of Gregory the Great, and he is going to be probably, we could call him really the first medieval pope, or you could call him the contemplative pope. Um, he's a very, very important uh, figure in church history. All right, so we've already talked about how the, the Eastern Empire is focused mainly in the east and can't look west. Well, uh, Gregory finds himself at a time when the city of Rome in the region of Italy has been uh, destroyed. It's been ransacked by wars. The Lombards are coming down at this point again and causing issues. And Gregory wanted to live as a monk. He was from a Roman senatorial family. That means he was from a very wealthy, well-to-do family. He wanted to live as a monk and actually was a Benedictine monk, Okay. Uh, Because it's pretty standard. He, however, was not able to live the solitary life. He's kind of like Augustine. Augustine wanted to live a kind of a solitary, monastic, quasi-life, and uh, it's not his lot in life to choose. He was chosen, what we would say, or what they would call the for secular vocation. Now we think of secular things, that's bad. They just mean secular this age. It's not primarily focused on spiritual things. They actually called priests or bishops secular bishops, not because they're worldly, but because they worked in the world with the people. Does that make sense? A little bit different usage than, than we do. But nonetheless, he's called to be a secular uh, priest. Um, so he's chosen to be eventually pope. And when he becomes pope, Rome is in disarray. All of the officials have essentially fled Rome. There's not any, anybody in charge of the army. He assumes control of reorganizing the army, reorganizes the defenses. The aqueducts and water systems are in disrepair, and water, good water's not getting to the city because there's been a lot of sieges fought over Rome. He gets those repaired. He takes the land around Rome that is, was from the donation of Pepin, and he gets it back in cultivation and uses that to feed the poor. <laughs> so he's doing all these temporal things, not primarily just spiritual things, but he gets those going, so kudos to him for doing all that. All the while, by the way, he is sick. He feels ill. Maybe he has gout or something like this, but he is constantly feeling sick every day of his life, chronically. Okay? So he's doing all those things. He's also manning, being the head of the church, being the bishop of also a place he preaches regularly, we have a lot of his sermons. He also writes, he writes one of the largest commentaries we have. It's a commentary on the book of Job, known as the Moralia. It's, it's massive. He writes a great book, and it's, I decided I was going to bring recommendations. This is going to be my uh, original source recommendation. Uh, his book called The Pastoral Care. We read this in, uh, when I was in college uh, to look at how he thought about pastoral ministry. A lot of great uh, ad- advice there. He writes that. Uh, he writes uh, a lot of other things, a lot of other sermons, a lot of other letters. Okay? Chronically ill, doing all these kind of secular things, also doing all these things. But one of the things he's going to be most known for, especially the English, is going to be for instigating the conversion of the English peoples. Okay? And that's where we will uh, look now. But one quick anecdote, it was in one of the pictures of the slide. Gregory, before he was pope, went into the market. And there were slaves in the market. And he noticed these young boys who had long golden hair. And he went over and asked, where are these uh, boys from? These fine-looking specimens. <laughs> That's pretty much how he says it. And they say, well, sir, they are angels. He says, oh, angels. (laughs) A-N-G-L-E-S versus A-N-G-E-L-S. 
Uh, angels, they deserve, these people deserve to essentially be in the kingdom of heaven with the angels because he finds out they're pagans. And then he says, uh, from what kingdom are they from? And he says, Deira. Deira is spelled D-E-I-R-A, or something close to that at least. And if you break that apart into two Latin words, Deira, it means from the wrath. He says, ah, oh, they must be spared from the wrath of God and, and, and experience the mercy of Christ. Maybe he's hard of hearing too. Well, we don't know that. But. And then he asks, who's their king? And they say, Ela. And he says, ah, oh, they also must sing the Alleluia. <laughs> so anyway, interesting story. Who knows if it's true, but as most great, uh, stories in the ancient world, they should be true if they're not. Um, <laughs> so nonetheless, while he is kind of a monk, he formulates this idea of sending a mission to the English or to the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes who have been or the barbarian tribes that come in and invade Rome. The Roman Empire leaves Rome in about the year 400 and leaves the native Britons on their own, and the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes come in and fight them and take control of the area. All right, so let's look at the mission to the Anglo-Saxons. So Rome is the kind of the seat of what we call Latin Christianity. And from there, Pope Gregory sends a guy by the name of Augustine, don't get him confused with the other one. He's long dead at this point. But we would call him Augustine of Canterbury. He is a Benedictine monk. <laughs> okay? He sends him and 40 other monks to these pagan kingdoms. Actually, on their way, they get so terrified, they come back and send a letter. Do we really have to go? Gregory's like, yes, boys, you know, toughen up, brave up, let's go. Get some courage in you. And they end up eventually going over there. Now, all these kings are pagans. Now, there is some Christian, Christianity there. Uh, the native population before the Anglo-Saxon came was Christian, and Irish Christians have been coming over, but that's a story for a second, in a second. Um, well, he meets with the king of Kent, a guy by the name of Ethelbert. Okay? Uh, his wife is Bertha. Um, we got Bertha and Ethelbert. Now, Bertha, you ready for this, is Frankish, and she is Orthodox Christian. Okay? See how the Franks are coming back into this story, too? Um, she also like we saw with uh, Clovis' wife, is encouraging him to convert to the faith, praying for him to convert to the faith, all these things. Well, when Ethelbert receives Augustine, they actually meet outside because he doesn't know anything about this religion much, and he's afraid that there's going to be some kind of magic involved. So he's, he thinks, if we meet outside, I won't be as susceptible to your magic tricks that you might do on me because, I mean, they're steeped in animism and paganism, which those things would have been a feature of that, right? Um, so they meet, and eventually he says, okay, listen, I, I don't know if I'm going to convert to this faith, but you can establish a, uh, a, a monastery and a church at a place called Canterbury, which is will be why we call him Augustine of Canterbury. Uh, and it's where the um, kind of head of the Church of England is still to this day. So he establishes there, and they begin to live a life. Now, they're living their ascetic life, which is denying themselves uh, of various worldly things and pleasures, and living a life of holiness, a life of devotion and prayer, and you need to understand that was one of the biggest factors in converting the people often is they saw the lives of these people and were influenced by it. And they also start going around and preaching. And eventually over time, Ethelbert becomes Christian. Now the primary vehicle, it's kind of contrary to what we think, the primary vehicle for a kind of coming to the faith for a lot of these tribes was through the king. The king would convert. Many of the nobles would convert. And then they would sometimes even have laws that kind of tried to curtail paganism tried to increase Christianity by various things. Sometimes they would destroy idols in places uh, to pagan gods, and that's going to cause issues too. But that was one of the main ways that they were able to convert the English over time. And it's not one steady process. Sometimes it's like you have a Christian king, and then he gets killed, and a pagan king rises up, and they destroy a lot of the churches and things, and then it comes back around. But eventually, uh, we're going to see uh, most of Britain become nominally Christian around the year 600, 650, if you want to think about it like that. It's largely, at least nominally Christian at this point. And a lot of this has to do with what uh, Augustine of Kent is doing. But it's not only that. We have this other branch. You can go to the next one. Uh, branch of Christianity in Ireland. Ireland was never Roman. The Romans never controlled Ireland. Um, but what we have happen is a young British boy named Patrick is out one day and gets captured by Irish pirates at the age of 16. And he's taken as a slave and lives several years as a slave in Ireland until he has a vision that uh, encourages him to flee, and he runs and gets passage and eventually ends up in Gaul where he becomes a, a Benedictine monk. <laughs> okay, you ready for that? Um, or he's at least trained to some extent by them. He never really fully able, is able to speak Latin very well. He finds it a foreign tongue, so he's more of a vernacular kind of guy, common language kind of guy. Um, he goes back later because he has another vision 
that he feels like he's being called to do what? Preach the gospel to the people that enslaved him. And he does. He goes back. And he lives in uh, this kind of uh, ascetic, monastic life. And Irish Christianity is a little bit different than other uh, uh, forms in the time, particularly what we see coming out of Rome. But eventually, many of the people there are going to become Christianized. And then what's going to happen after that is you're going to get guys like Columba, who is going to establish a monastery at a place called Iona, kind of in between uh, Scotland and Ireland, Britain to the south there. And that monastery with Columba, they will then go evangelize the group in the north who are currently living in Scotland called the Picts. They will evangelize many of them. Later on, another monk by the name of Aidan will come to one of the English kingdoms of Northumbria and will be responsible for seeing many of those people convert. So what you need to see is you've got this kind of two-pronged attack, not intentionally, of Christianizing Britain at the time. Okay? You've got the Roman church sending people, but you also have the uh, kind of unorganized, uh, haphazard kind of uh, attempt by the Irish church, which is working as well. Um, now, this is important because the Roman church and the Irish church disagree. One of the things they disagree on, which would seem petty to us, is when do you celebrate Easter? Okay? Um, they had different times to celebrate it, and for many people at the time, they were beginning to practice what's called Lent, which is a time uh, of fasting uh, beforehand. So you would have this time of fasting before you had the great f- uh, festal celebration of Easter. Okay? Um, well, what the problem was is you might have a king that would follow the Roman way and a um, queen that would follow the Irish way. That was pretty common because they're dynastic marriages. Well, one of the kings is kind of upset about this. Why? He's like, while I am feasting, my wife is in, you know, wearing black and she is kind of uh, in, in sorrow to some extent while I'm trying to feast. It's really ruining all this. We've got to figure out a way to do this. But also, this is very contentious. Bede almost, uh, when he's writing his church of the uh, English or history of the English people, almost is wanting to put them in the camp of heretics for holding this, okay? Probably a little extreme for us. And another thing that they're debating is, how do you cut the tonsure on the head of monks? So you've probably all seen the picture of Tim Tebow when he became a Denver Bronco and they cut the big uh, hole in his head there, or his hair, cut his hair out there. Do you know what I'm talking about? He just had the hair going around here, no hair on top. Okay, that's called a tonsure, okay? Uh, in certain forms of Christianity, the Roman form, you would cut the tonsure like that, cut just the top of the head off there. In Irish forms of Christianity... You would draw a line from the ear to the other ear, and you'd either cut the front part or the back part off, okay? So they debated about how the tonsure should be cut, okay? But probably what's really at stake here is are we going to be submissive and follow the teachings and direction of Rome or of this other form of Christianity? And what eventually wins out, and this is another reason you can say the Pope's authority is not exclusive and dominating. They have a big debate over this. Eventually it is decided we will follow the Roman church in its way of doing things. And that will be the next slide, which we can skip uh, which will be the Synod of Whitby. Um, all right, well, then after the English have been converted, what do they do? Some of the monks from there start to go to the continent <laughs> and start evangelizing because still Gaul and parts of Germany that have not been uh, controlled by the Franks are still not Christian, nominally Christian, and need uh, uh, preaching to. So we get um, an Irishman, Columbanus, or Columban, that goes in the year 6, or he dies 615, but before that he goes and he establishes monasteries in Gaul and even in Italy. Uh, we get a guy by the name of Boniface. Boniface was the one that crowned Pepin II. We talked about that earlier. He's the monk that's sent there. He's helping to reform the church in Gaul with um, Pepin the Short. But Boniface would go, and he would be known as the apostle to the Germans. Uh, he would work among the Phrygian peoples. Um, there's a story when he was in Phrygia, that he went down and uh, the oak was sacred to the god Thor. And he went down into kind of the middle of this pagan area and chopped down a sacred oak to Thor and then built a church from the, the timber. <laughs> um, probably told a little more dramatically than it really was, but he do, it maybe did do that. But nonetheless, the people see, well, Thor didn't strike him down, and the people are, are said to have converted uh, to Christianity. Uh, he will be killed, by the way, while in the act of baptizing uh, new converts by uh, roving bandits. Now, I don't think it was necessarily because he was a Christian. They wanted to kill him for that, maybe. But nonetheless, he was baptizing, and he was killed for that. So in some sense, he's some kind of martyr. Uh, but he's a very important uh, missionary to the continent. All right. Well, um, you can go to the question slide, but hopefully we begin to see now we've got a whole new world order going on. The Romans are a thing of the past. Uh, we've got a new situation with the Frankish kings and the Roman church and the Benedictine monks kind of being the arm, the right arm of the church. All right, any questions? A lot to wrap your head around me. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, if, yeah, Dave. I don't know how to ask the question, Where's the where's the lineage, if you will, that if, if there is any, of Orthodox Christianity thread weaving through all this? In other words, from the apostles in the first century, and, and you know, and bif- what we would call a biblical understanding of, <coughs> of scriptures and of theology. And of course, you know, we're, we're Baptists. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and you know that eventually emerges before, during, and after the Reformation. But in this period, there doesn't seem to be any group or any movement that's carrying that torch. Rather, it seems it's all over the place. Yeah. And yet, it eventually emerges, which to me speaks to the sovereignty of God, to take his own truth mm-hmm. through all of this turmoil for centuries and still come out on the other end with yeah. All right, so the question essentially is, when we're looking at medieval Christianity broadly probably, uh, maybe even ancient Christianity, um, it would appear to us maybe as Baptists, as Protestants, that there's not um, kind of faithful Christians. Would that be fair? Um, so where is that line? Because later on some people will trace certain groups and say these were, you know, whether the Hussites or the Lollards that are faithful to Christianity. Um, I don't think that's the most helpful way to break it down. A lot of the things that, that are going to be disagreed about, that, we, that I would, I mean, Gregory is going to promote purgatory. He's going to be one of the really uh, ones that gets that going. I don't think that's a uh, correct biblical teaching. Okay? Um, so he's got things like that that I disagree with. That's fine. I think when, to some extent, broadly, we would say that even Baptists in recent history would have advocated things like landmark Baptists I do not agree with at all. Okay? Um, so just because somebody has a wrong teaching uh, in certain areas doesn't necessarily mean they are not Christian. So I think that would be the first thing I would broadly say. Um, so, for instance, the idea of justification by faith I do think is present in certain ways. It's not a formulated doctrine because people aren't debating it at this point. That's not the big issue. The big debates at the time are going to be over Christology. They're going to be over um, the divinity of Christ, um, so the Trinity. Those are going to be some of the big debates for the, about the first, you know, seven, eight hundred years of the church, and they go on later as well. There's not so much a big debate going over things that we would say now are very central and important, like justification by faith. Once those, and this is the way I think church history works, is, so for instance, with Christology, it's not that big of a debate or the Trinity until what? Until you have somebody that teaches wrong, something wrong, and then that's opposed, and it leads to kind of these back and forth debates. So I think that's important to remember, too, that people do have uh, ideas that we would say are not biblical or incorrect. But, but I wouldn't want to just very simply and easily dismiss the person as a whole or say they're not part of the faith if they have that. A lot of the groups that are often pointed to by people in certain traditions of the Baptist church that would point to and say, well, we've got this trail of martyrs or something like this throughout the church, they're pretty heretical themselves. And if you dive deeper into some of the things, even the Hussites, for instance, they would be like, eh, I'm uncomfortable with that. So um, I, I would just say this. When we look back at church history, we're going to find things that we disagree with. But a lot of what's happening is over time, people are formulating things, thinking through things, debating things, and it's taking some time to kind of shake out. I mean, the Trinity is the first example, right? There's not somewhere you read in John's Gospel, so here's the doctrine of the Trinity that you should formulate and believe. But that's kind of present and incipient in the Bible, and that's what I would say about the things that I hold true as a Baptist. I'd say I believe they are in the Scripture. That's why I believe them. That doesn't mean that they said, all right, guys, here's the exact way you should think about baptism in Mark chapter 2, <laughs> right? That's kind of parsed out, and it's debated and hashed over. Um, so I think that's also important to remember. I think we need to, as we're doing and looking at some of these people, it is important when we get deeper into their theology that we don't say, oh, you're this great person like Augustine. I mean, Augustine, he kind of hypothesizes about purgatory. <laughs> he doesn't say he believes it. He says, well, maybe this could work out. Gregory, who's very influenced by Augustine, picks it up and says, yes, I think this is right. So we, we praise people like Augustine, uh, and I think we should look at the others in the medieval church kind of in a similar way. They did a lot of great things. I don't agree with all they did. But uh, and I can critique them, and we all, to some extent, fall short. And anyway, that, that's probably uh, this way to answer your question. That's how I generally approach it. So, other questions? Is there any historical evidence that the monks ever held fast to the gospel? Yeah, I, I mean, well, it depends on what you mean by the, the gospel. If you, um, I mean, yes, I would say, yeah, you do get them. 
they, they were very faithful men. I, I think if we're going to critique monasticism, what, what I would want to say is the separation of the world is problematic. Um, the, and this distinction almost between what become the athletes of God, the real Christians, the OGs versus everybody else, you get this division that's, I think, unbiblical and unhelpful that the Reformation recovers um, where you don't have this two-tiered elite monks versus kind of everybody else. You know, when I came to Cornerstone, one of the kind of reviving teachings that I heard was something like um, from the pulpit was talking about a mom and her, the value of her work. Or if you're working a job just you know, in a factory or something, like that is God-honoring. You do, the, do that to the glory of God, and that is worthy. In, in systems like this, you can diminish it. We, I think, sometimes wrestle that too. We can sometimes want to emphasize rightly the importance of church planning and pastors and missionaries. And if you hear the message wrong, you could hear it being said, well, if you're not being a church planner, then you are kind of some sense unvaluable. That's not the message that's being communicated. Uh, but there's a tendency there, and that does happen in monasticism. Um, but some of the most prolific authors and, and commentators on Scripture were monks. I mean, they, I mean that stuff's in their blood deep. Um, and I, I would say they're being, to some extent, faithful with what, what they do have. Uh, I think some of the understandings of certain things are going to be clarified later. But that would be my way to answer that, too. Other questions? In the monastic uh, community in Canterbury, was that comprised of like an initial monk from... I don't know about afterwards, but initially it started, Augustine came with 40 monks and they established it there. Yeah, I, I don't know about afterwards. I would assume so that local people, Patrick does that in Ireland, a lot of the uh, local nobles actually, children, uh, start joining him. So that's pretty common for uh, local people to eventually start joining. And they form other monasteries as well and churches. After an initial community of monks? Or mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions? All right, well, if no other questions, I think yeah, it's 9.53. Let's wait a couple minutes before we head out uh, to give the first service time to, to leave. All right. You-